Beautiful, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about um, <clears throat> large language models in general, but GPT in specific, uh, and their potential uh, in HTA. Uh, I have kind of tweaked this as I've listened to some of the sessions throughout to try to make sure I'm kind of getting the, uh, all the audiences. But the overall goal today is just to walk through three use cases, um, look at some of the upsides, some of the lessons I've learned trying to use uh, these in like my day-to-day -day work with Irisana. Um, and also inspire you to think of how to use these base tools to create things for your use cases instead of relying on uh, the thousands and thousands of third party apps that kind of show up every day. So uh, for all of these, what I've done is use the uh, GPT-4 um, uh, via the OpenAI API. Uh, and the reason I, I do it this way is because um, using the OpenAI API, you default to not uh, sharing anything you're sending uh, for the purpose of training their models. Uh, whereas you have to kind of make that choice right now still, I think, with ChatGPT. Um, I still would not recommend, uh, just kind of as, at a broad level, if you have any sensitive information, probably not the best to be sharing that. Um, are we talking about like just general code um, and that sort of stuff? So these are the three use cases I'm going to talk about. So one is just kind of like code improvement, thinking of uh, like different applications of or different approaches in code. Uh, gaining efficiency. I'm going to talk about code translation, which kind of I hope talks to some of this um, uh, polyglot uh, sort of uh, conversation I've seen a couple different times. So talking about uh, a function I took from SAS to R. Uh, and then the kind of most risky is kind of can you extend your abilities using this? So um, an example of um, a somewhat silly, but I think um, um, informational um, application um, uh, making this uh, search, uh, semantic search. So for code improvement, uh, the general idea is like, can we use large language models to help improve the efficiency of our code? So can we make our code faster? Um, can we help it with commenting and documenting code? Um, can we use it to help identify potentially brittle code or uh, possible issues that we're not seeing? Um, and I, the, I've kind of uh, classified this as low risk because generally I'm thinking of like you're Going back to your historical code, you're using it as a learning tool. You're saying, okay, hey, like, what's an application of the same thing if I were to write it in like data table? Like, how could I get started on that instead of using base R? If I wanted to translate this dplyr to base R, how would I do that? Um, and so you're not kind of uh, going too far beyond your own abilities. Um, so what I've done for the sake of exploration was I created this very contrived situation where you want to. Um, log all the continuous variables um, in a data set. And you've, for whatever reason, decided to start this by uh, just a bunch of if else statements um, and kind of the least efficient, least readable, uh, lots uh, prone for many errors, uh, one of which you may see already. I did plant one. Um, and then just say, okay, can you just start by adding comments to this code, provide a short line by line summary of what it's doing? So the response from that is kind of what we see here. So it's gone through, it's not the most efficient even on the commenting side. So it did add a comment to every single uh, uh, row, even though they're all kind of doing the same thing. It's not necessarily what I would do. Uh, and then it's output uh, that we have here is in summary, this code load empty cars, uh, which is a built-in data set, checks if each of the specified columns are numeric or not. If it's numeric, takes the natural log um, and creates a new column with a log suffix. Um, now, what's interesting is that it did, without me asking, uh, identify that in all my copying and pasting, um, I made the error of, um, for the QSEC uh, column, um, taking the log of uh, the weight um, column instead. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. That was kind of an unprompted um, uh, suggestion, a helpful hint. Um, so now I need a follow-up, said, okay, can you provide a critique of the code? and describe some of the general best practices that could be considered to improve it. So this is like, can I use GPT to help me learn more about how to code in R or in Python or Julia or in SAS or anything else you might be trying to use it for? Um, and so this is the response. So the first was code repetition. Uh, so same code pattern repeated multiple times, uh, makes it less maintainable, more prone to errors. Uh, can be addressed by the writing of function or a loop to apply the transformation in each column. Um, that's a good, uh, I think, piece of feedback. Uh, I see it still even um, with people who are uh, well uh, versed in R um, being more repetition than they have to be. Um, it identified this error in the calculation of the QSEC uh, column. Um, so I think that weight should be replaced with QSEC, which I think is a good judgment. 
Uh, and then interestingly, and this is kind of like going under the like thinking about lessons learned and like how much can you really let this do everything for you versus being a partner that you're that you're working with uh, through the development is that it says this kind of unnecessary use of if of if else. And the reason it gives uh, isn't that like uh, there's a better thing to use than if else. It's that everyone knows the empty cars data set doesn't have any uh, non numeric columns. Um, which is actually leading you in a way to creating uh, more brittle code. Um, so I kind of ignored uh, that piece of advice, the same as you sometimes will ignore advice from uh, colleagues or friends um, if you disagree with it. Uh, so for best practices, said come on, try like, like using a loop or an apply function, um, try properly naming variables. Uh, you might want to consider commenting your code. Um, so I actually passed it. It's funny, it's kind of commenting on itself. I passed it, it's commented version. Um, so it's a good idea, good idea to include clear comments throughout your code, make it easier for others just to understand and maintain. Um, and I think for me, it's more like what is the intent of this piece that's missing, as opposed to the, the comments on what exactly each line is doing. And then this is good too. I mean, it's telling you maybe consider vectorized operations uh, because uh, operations, because R is highly optimized for that. Um, so if you leverage that wherever it's possible, you might be able to improve performance. And this is a pretty standard. Um, if you do all the good training that's available from uh, some of the people that I know are in attendance here, um, it's one of the things that they'll um, often encourage as well. So all kind of like good signs. So I said, okay, can you give me three examples um, that uh, one is in uh, a base R version of uh, this function that's applying these kind of best practices you're suggesting, one that's in a tidyverse style and one that you could write with a package data table. And then give me the pros and cons of each um, and gave it some extra kind of uh, some thinking. So I wanted to avoid that skipping the if else statement piece. So I said, consider making the code as general as possible. For a while, for example, while the columns are known to be numeric, we might want to use this on something with a data set that we aren't as familiar with. Um, I also asked it to provide some suggestions for error catches um, and some useful messages when unexpected inputs are passed. Um, lastly, just kind of say like, what do you think about this code? Do you think it's general? Do you think it'll break uh, return unexpected results? So um, this is the, the base R uh, uh, version. Oh, sorry, I actually unexpectedly changed that. And, um, oh gosh, sorry to say I've, edited that in the last minute uh, to the tidyverse style. So it did provide a base R um, version. It was not uh, It was uh, not vectorized. So it was uh, like a for loop, essentially, that was doing everything. Um, so the pros was that it was easy to understand, didn't require external libraries. Um, the cons were that maybe it wasn't as efficient as other methods. Um, I think that's probably incorrect. Um, so the tidyverse style, so this is, uh, I had to actually go back and forth with the, with the tidyverse a little bit to get a version that worked. Um, because it didn't understand kind of some aspects of what it was uh, what it was asking for. So for the tidyverse style, I thought it was interesting. Used like across, uh, used all of. So these were like relatively new. I, plenty of people that I work with still don't use across or all of uh, as functions. Uh, it says uh, if it's numeric, log it. If else, uh, give a warning uh, that it's not numeric, and then uh, add the names for the um, the column name and then log at the end. Um, so it, it thinks that this is concise and easier to read, Use, utilizes the benefits of tidyverse, um, requires an external library, um, and the warning message uh, might not be as clear as in the base R version, um, which I don't really agree with. They were both essentially the same. Uh, for the data table uh, implementation, this is kind of what they went with here. So again, Similar, um, I'm not as familiar with data table as uh, tidyverse. So uh, one thing that I think we'll talk about uh, at the end is, is this really the most efficient implementation of the data table solution? I don't think it is, um, but it does work. Um, and so its pros are saying that data tables, memory efficient, fast solution for large data sets, which is true. Um, allows for in-place modifications, which is more memory efficient, which is also true. It should be one of the main benefits over uh, dplyr. Um, it does require an external library. It didn't kind of catch the fact that one of the nice things about uh, data table is that it is only reliant on itself, essentially. So you're not um, importing all the other dependencies of um, dplyr and everything else. And the syntax is not going to be as understandable. Overall, it says they all do what you asked me to do. Uh, it should work and be quite general robust uh, since the function checks whether it's numeric. It didn't really think about kind of the other things that might come through. 
or whether that's going to be a robust test on its own. You could probably dig into that uh, a little bit more. I didn't do that here. Um, it does uh, give a suggestion for a warning message, which a lot of people uh, still that I work with while writing, call, while writing functions, we don't always kind of consider writing a warning message or catches or they're using test that or um, kind of having that documentation. So it's nice to potentially be able to use this uh, for that purpose. Um, as a bonus prompt, I said, okay, can you give me some Roxygen 2 style comments uh, for base R functions? So those of you that write uh, packages are all familiar with this um, uh, with this package or this approach to documentation. Um, I thought this was actually a pretty nice. Um, I've used it quite a bit for uh, adding this sort of documentation. So I, I'd say this is kind of one of the areas that it does uh, generally um, do a good job. Still always needing to review and kind of tweak things. And I, I don't think it really ever gives you anything as like a final product. Um, and so overall, I find I did a little bit of benchmarking afterwards uh, and found that actually the data, the data table solution it gave was the slowest. So it was slower than tidy versus slower than base. And so I think to me, that suggests that maybe it's not great at a zero shot implementation of the most efficient solution within any particular package. And like, to be honest, you're asking a lot of it to do that. Um, but I think that's an interesting point and certainly one that everyone I think attending here is probably uh, interested to, um, to know. Um, GPT was able to recognize that we don't really want a log column of NAs when there isn't a column that's numeric. So I think I thought it was a good piece of judgment. So the, uh, all the, all the applications that did would not just return a, a column of NAs if it wasn't numeric, whereas the code that I wrote would. Um, I don't think any of these were like a finished product that you would put in a production, but they all kind of give you a nice place to start and can help you think about kind of different implementations across packages um, or different ways of thinking of things. So maybe you are trying to write something entirely in data table and you're more familiar with tidyverse or base and you're stuck on a particular problem and there's no good stack overflow solution. And so maybe you can use this to translate back uh, to tidyverse and work through some of the problems that you have. Um, so it's a little contrived. I think it does kind of teach us about some of the things that LLMs can do uh, in a safe way. So just alternate implementations, understanding why some may be better than others. Um, you have to dig a little bit deeper to really get into that, I think. Identifying some of the errors and correctly inferring the context of what you're trying to do. And uh, potentially to help reduce reliance on external dependencies. So those of you that are creating packages, um, it is nice to not have to depend on a bunch of stuff written by other people that may or may not update at any given time. Um, and so if you're not as familiar with base, like I'm not as familiar with base, uh, this can be helpful um, when you're trying to make those changes. So the next is a little bit less uh, um, of an in-depth example, but uh, the, the next approach is kind of uh, to try this poly MAIC uh, translation. So this is um, the standard kind of Signorovich implementation, TSD-18 implementation of uh, matching adjusted indirect comparisons or MACs, target exact matching of moments, um, which can give you really low effective sample sizes in some cases. And so if you're willing to trade bias variance, then um, this polynomial MAC that was uh, developed allows matching with intolerances. So you can say, I want to match the mean to at least like uh, five or the SD of the mean within at least like 0.2. Uh, it can be useful if some of the variables are known to be more important than others, which is often the case, I'd say. Um, so you can tolerate a little bit less exact matching on those. So there's this paper uh, by Jonathan Alsop. He may or may not be in attendance. Uh, it's a really great paper. It's really well written um, with the implementation. Uh, the code they provide is in uh, a SAS appendix, it's in, or it's in the appendix, in, it's in SAS code. And I am not familiar with SAS at all. I don't work in SAS ever. Um, so I thought, hey, can I use GPT to summarize uh, what's happening, translate it to R, and then try to generalize it? Um, the example they gave is just for kind of two um, continuous and a, and a binary variable. Uh, so in summary, I'm not going to kind of have everything here, but uh, basically what they said is kind of that this SAS code is for determining the optimal weights to match IPD to ALD for age and gender, determines optimal weighting. Um, within the uh, level of targets using polynomial functions for age and sex, uses a nonlinear optimization with multiple starting points. Translating this code to R should be fairly straightforward using the Optum or Analopter package. Um, still some reformatting and modifications would be required. So I said, okay, it understands what's going on. So can it actually make something? And so the first time I did this, uh, I, uh, I just kind of, um, I didn't save this whole process. So I kind of had to start from scratch. So it does uh, come up with a slightly different uh, solution this time around. 
uh, but with some troubleshooting, so I do a lot of back and forth, uh, it was able to come up with a working example that does what it's supposed to. And so this is not, I'm not familiar with uh, constraint optimization, I'm not familiar with SAS. Um, so obviously this is a high risk environment to be in uh, as a coder. And so basically the way that I kind of tested this was to look at a bunch of different simulations, a bunch of different targets, um, have GPT go back and like describe the code that it translated, make sure it's still doing the thing it's supposed to be doing. And then I uh, wanted to then generalize this to kind of everything, right? Because you have your age, in this case, polynomial, everything is making a lot of assumptions about what the data is going to look like. Um, so can we generalize it? That was a uh, very long process. Uh, so I'm not going to go over it here. The code's all up on uh, my GitHub at PolyNASC, but uh, in general, it was, um, I would just say, very challenging to keep uh, GPT on topic at times and uh, not getting a little stuck in loops. And you really do have to help it along and say, like, actually, you can't do this in R. Can you think of a different approach? Maybe something like this. And then it can do this, something like this application. So overall, I'd say um, I found GPT in this particular application is sometimes unaware of some of the requirements of particular optimizers. So some of them you need to pass a gradient function for, and then you would provide that error code and it would change the optimizer, but then it might not realize some other aspects. So um, maybe the new optimizer doesn't allow you to do like inequality constraints, it only allows equality constraints. And so then you pass the code back to it, say it's got this error and it sends you back to the first optimizer. Um, I also find it sometimes gets close, but not quite there. So um, for the this particular application, so these inequality constraints uh, in this function here, in order to be true, they have to validate uh, as less than or equal to zero, and they had that in the wrong direction originally. So it's only by going and reading the help file and understanding what's going on with that particular optimizer that you will see that. Uh, so the overall kind of learning here was that it's really not enough to just copy and paste. You need to evaluate seek help from GPT itself or from Stack Overflow or colleagues and understanding uh, the function documentation. Um, and so I'd say this really is like kind of a high risk uh, implementation right now. You really do need to be able to at least work through the logic of how things could be going wrong. And the last thing here I'll try to do really quickly uh, to leave up some, some time for questions, but um, the Swiss search. So I was talking about, can this help me do qualitative research? I love qualitative research offer important insights into experience of disease, narrative illness recovery, understanding power balances, um, provide insight, insight into aspects of value that are not readily counted, of which there are many, as much as we wish there weren't. Um, and I would say it's not typically a core skill set within uh, generalist or consultancies like Eversana. So we don't have anyone that does this within our group. Uh, so I wondered, can LLMs help to lower the barrier of entry to deeper qualitative analysis of text? And this would be kind of the highest risk um, because you are essentially giving something to someone with no expertise and the, you don't have the same ability to, to QC things as in depth because you're talking about gigantic corpuses of uh, literature or of, um, or of interviews. So the SWIFT search, the goal was to provide a proof of concept for LLMs to a large corpus. Um, so I used at the time, this was back in Christmas before GPT 3.5 and 4, um, used the GPT G3 DaVinci API endpoint, um, summarizing the meaning of all lyrics in Taylor Swift's discography as of the midnight's release. Uh, so this was done in two prompts. The first was conduct a qualitative thematic analysis of the following song, provide a quote from the song to support each theme, finished by summarizing the overall emotion conveyed. The second prompt is if the song were a person, who would it be? Um, and then provide a quote to support each trait. Then took uh, from these as output. So in these uh, LLMs, you can't send all of Taylor Swift's uh, discography through it all at once at this point. So what I did was uh, ask GPT for some help and it suggested using vector embeddings. So this is where you use a different endpoint. I uh, use the add embeddings endpoint and you turn each of the results of these two prompts uh, strung together into uh, a numeric representation of their semantic meaning. And then you use um, a like a cosine similarity uh, which is just finding the dot product of uh, that big chunk of uh, that embedding and something that you pass. So you could pass like an emotion, convert that to the same embedding endpoint, and then it's going to find the song that most closely matches that is the general idea. Um, and again, this whole thing was kind of uh, designed in partnership with ChatGPT. So this is kind of the, the output that you get. I made a little shiny app for it. So put in nervous and excited. Uh, you get everything has changed. Uh, with the themes, so giving each of the themes, the new experiences, nervous excitement, longing for connection, appreciation for change, the overall emotion, 
the personality traits um, kind of as as asked. Um, and then uh, soon you'll get better for hope. I think this is a great song for hope. Uh, this is kind of a good example of what working the way it's supposed to. Um, and the song is kind of uh, about somebody with some uh, sort of severe illness. Um, and it kind of does a really good job, I think, of uh, the qualitative analysis of this piece of work. So I am not a Swifty. I am, uh, this is too much to someone for someone to review. Um, and so the way that I approach validation for this uh, was essentially to identify a group of people um, that were kind of self-identified super fans, ask them for feedback. They helped to identify some bugs, some prompt in the tweaking uh, process that were need, um, uh, that was needed essentially. So just to say like with all these, it's never just like a finished product um, directly out of the model in my experience for the stuff that we're doing anyways. So kind of in summary, I'd say that um, LLMs could probably support some qualitative research uh, and could allow for an increase in scale that I think would otherwise be impossible. So you'd be talking about like some of the form analyses that you might have seen on uh, being done where it was really kind of a surface level uh, interpretation. I think we could go into something much more in depth and much more rigorous. Um, in the short term though, I think it's best as more of a supportive tool. So I have some colleagues at uh, the School of Nursing here uh, in uh, Nova Scotia. We've kind of talked to them about how like maybe this could be something that would be really helpful for less experienced staff um, to kind of uh, gut check against them um, or to provide like different perspectives on the same text. So maybe you're doing a qualitative thematic analysis. That's one thing that you might want to see, like how would this text be interpreted from a phenomenological standpoint, which is like an entirely different or from a, um, like a critical race theory standpoint. Um, to see how that same data could be telling you a, a slightly different story uh, or focusing on different aspects of it. Um, I think there's obviously this issue of kind of needing to navigate some difficult data privacy considerations. Um, so you probably need something local uh, that runs locally or that runs under uh, things you can control if you're really going to try to do this with um, like true qualitative interviews, for example. Um, but I also think it's kind of evidence that like this whole idea uh, was essentially co-created with ChatGPT. Um, came up with the idea for the embeddings. Came up with the idea of like it was a, essentially like a, originally like a um, a topic modeling exercise, um, and then it kind of gave me the idea of like well maybe we can use the LLM instead of kind of these other uh, topic modeling approaches that were really not working um, the way they're supposed to. So in that sense, like I think kind of overall uh, the theme has been like more treating these is less that it's going to do all the work for you, less it's going to replace you, and more that like you're building something in partnership with what is essentially a machine that has many of the same faults that um, your colleagues will have um, and many of the same blind spots. Um, so overall, I'd say kind of truly independent agents. So people might have seen kind of the um, like uh, AGI, uh, like baby AGI or auto GPT, where you're kind of sending these things out into the wild. Um, I think that's a, a long ways away of actually being totally independently being able to work based off my uh, experiences. I think some of the tasks, uh, so like anecdotally, uh, like some things just are, better, are not well suited um, for LLMs at this moment. Um, anecdotally, I find like, like GPT 3.5, so like what was originally like the chat GPT, um, I find it creates more fake packages and functions than GPT 4. So for coding, I usually use GPT 4. Um, I think true disruption is probably like a longer term problem. Um, so a lot of people, even people on our team are, fear of being, are afraid of being replaced. So like screening, for example, for SLRs, uh, people are very worried that they're gonna be replaced by a machine that can essentially screen day and night. Um, but I think that is a long ways away. We've been trying to use it for some data extraction, uh, data extraction problems um, and the existing kind of publicly available vision, uh, like AI vision, um, uh, applications are just not there for data extraction and uh, the data extraction piece is so complex it's like you might have um, an investigator assessed DFS and uh, an IRC uh, independent review committee assessed uh, like a uh, complete response and kind of understanding which of those two things have to be extracted together I think is probably um, a little bit more difficult than just throwing a robot at it uh, but with that being said, I think AI could probably be contributing to your workflow today if it isn't already. So I use it uh, probably at least three or four times a week uh, for different problems. Uh, we have people on the team. We're currently using it to try to train someone to use R who has no um, uh, prior experience with R. 
um, uh, comes from an SPSS world. So they know a little bit of what they need to do, but not really how to get there. Uh, so we're kind of getting some experience with that. Um, we've had some people do some really amazing applications where just like a really clever uh, research assistant with uh, time and interest is able to kind of um, uh, help us with doing huge automation of report tasks that just like no one had time to do. Uh, and this person was able to figure it out in our, with the use uh, of GPT and come up with something that is working, um, which is actually pretty amazing um, when you think of it. And with that, uh, if there's any questions um, or comments, or um, hopefully nobody noticed any additional errors in my code, but uh, be happy to have a conversation. Thanks, Tim. That's fantastic. And thank you for keeping to time. So there's a question from Howard. Uh, can ChatGPT read and work with Excel files or the underlying XML? Uh, so I'm not as up to date on everything that is available within uh, GPT plugins now. There may be, uh, there are there are some, like the, there's a code interpreter, like a Python code interpreter that you can upload at least some types of data files, CSVs. Um, uh, I'm not sure if um, it's going to get the logic of like the if else statements and everything else and like the formula that are in cells. Um, I think that piece is, you probably need something in between at the moment. Um, there, yeah, I'd probably like uh, if there was like an intermediate or like if you had like a via Python or R or something else, if you could get that information and then cut it up into something that you could send to the API. Um, I think that's probably the short-term solution but. and I, I was very interested in your experiences with the literature searching because i think that's something that perhaps is potential with llms um could you expand a little bit on what those difficulties were and whether you see any prospect for them being overcome um because it's obviously potentially labor intensive it's not free from error if a human does it and as someone who hasn't used um, LLM seriously, it does seem there is potential. So I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think um, it is the lowest hanging fruit that we're all trying to find solve for at the moment, um, because it's a lot of people spending a lot of time, um, definitely. So the, the issues that we found is um, the applications I've tried so far has just been to uh, actually extract the components of uh, of picos and then do some like regular expression stuff to see if it actually matches the criteria as a sec as a second step. So we tried first saying like, is this um, doing like a few shot prompt? So you give it some examples of here's an abstract that should be excluded, here's one that should be included, and here's the reasons. And then you pass it a new one and say like, would you include this? Um, and we found it was just the error rates were too high. Like it was just not doing very well. Um, but it did a lot better when you just asked it to extract. What is the population? What is the intervention? What is the comparator? What's the outcomes? What's the study design? And then you do a separate process where you then do like an, uh, a yes or no based off of like meeting those criteria. Um, like that's what we found more success. It's still not perfect, which is an unfair um, standard, I think, because the humans are not perfect. Uh, but once you go to somebody who's saying, hey, look, we got like 80% agreement, which is probably better than you got like on any SLR, like first screen or second screen or review that we've done in the last little while, uh, they still want 100% before they kind of feel safe. Um, yeah. So, Yeah, that, that's really interesting. So it sounds like there might be a little bit of um, prompt engineering and design about the workflow that feeds into what, what it's doing that would maybe get that error rate down even lower. Um, so possibly something to look at. Yeah, yeah, definitely some of that. Or like, um, there's a whole other world that we didn't look at of like, is would it be even better just to take like the DaVinci, I don't know, like GPT-3 endpoint, fine tune that to be an SLR screener, which is then like very inexpensive um, and you're training it to do just one specific task. So you might have a lot more success. Um, Great, fantastic. So we're at the end of your lot of time. Thank you, Tim. That was super interesting. Um...